Good morning and welcome to Round Hill United Methodist Church in our virtual worship service. My name is Kathy Lutman. I am a lay member here at Round Hill. Our pastor Daniel is in his second week of quarantine from uh, being on vacation. But if you need him, he is available. He just isn't here in the building with us today. But he has given us um, a pre-recorded sermon this morning that has a very timely message from the book of Romans about um, love and how love conquers evil. The format that we use for our worship is Facebook Live, which allows you to interact with each other. You can make comments. You have like buttons, love buttons, hug buttons. Um, so feel free to express yourself through any of those means. If there's something that you like, um, feel free to you know hit the little love or like button and you'll see the, the little balloon going floating up. Um, so as we be prepare ourselves to hear our sermon this morning, I would like you to join me in a short prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We ask that you be with each of us today as we receive the message, that you would prepare our hearts, that the words of Daniel will be your words and that will come into our hearts and uh, make a difference in our day-to-day -day lives. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And as we continue to prepare for worship, um, we will be singing the song, Love the Lord. The words will be on the screen. Feel free to sing along at home or use it as a time of meditation to prepare for our sermon. So know your mind and all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. Our sermon scripture for this morning comes from Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. 
honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Will you join me in a word of prayer? May the words of my mouth the meditation of all of our hearts. Be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. This quote by Martin Luther King Jr. is probably one of his most famous quotes, and it's one that epitomizes his civil rights philosophy. Because King is such a monumental civil rights figure, however, for one whom we find you know, etched in stone alongside the likes of the great presidents, it can be easy for us to forget that King was also a minister. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. is the same as Martin Luther King Jr., the civil rights leader. In fact, the two in one are the same in his philosophy, his theology, his faith, is what leads him, it's what guides him towards this justice and towards this equality that he seeks. As he speaks these elegant quotes, such as the one about darkness and light that we heard, about love and hate, what we hear is his faith pouring out. We, in fact, as we listen closely, can hear echoes of our scripture of Romans 12, about love conquering hate. As I reflect on this scripture about love conquering hate, I do so with a little joy and uh, nostalgia in my heart because it is, in fact, the very first scripture that I ever preached upon. I had the great privilege growing up to have a church that allowed me to explore my calling and to do so by preaching as a youth a couple of times. And so... Uh, my very first time that I had this opportunity to preach, I was given the opportunity to, to choose all of the scriptures. You know, any scripture that I wanted to preach upon was open and fair game. And so, as a youth, which scripture would I choose? You know, I, I didn't choose one of Jesus' great miracles. I, I didn't choose a, a great call story like Moses and the burning bush. I didn't even choose my own namesake, Daniel, and the the lion's den. Now, out of everything that is in the Bible, all the great stories that we find, I, in my youth, decided to choose a seemingly random text from one of Paul's densest letters that he could write, the, the book of Romans. But this section of Romans jumped out to me. It spoke to me, the same as it does to me today. I think part of the reason it spoke to me then as it does today is the context in which I was reading it and preaching it. I preached this sermon originally. It's not the same sermon, but I preached from this scripture originally in 2002 or 2003 in a time where my generation had just experienced their first great catastrophe of their generation. I hate that I have to say it that way, but that's kind of the way it has been. But we had just experienced 9-11. And we were now in the kind of aftermath, the aftershocks of it, and in a nation that was trying to put itself back together after the horrors of it. And as a youth, what I had noticed is that the life that I had seen before and the life that was after were, were completely different. And much of what I saw after 
frankly, I did not like. I did not like what I was seeing. Xenophobia was on the rise, especially when it came to our Muslim brethren, or in fact, anyone who appeared Muslim, like the Sikh community. There was a, a huge political divide and tension, much of it surrounding the war in Iraq. Heightened security could be found anywhere that people gathered in airports or sporting events or any large gathering in a way that I know I at least had never experienced before and felt like such a change to the lifestyle that I had lived. In fact, everything felt like such a, a, a great change. You know, this 90s kid, I, I had not experienced this type of angst in my life before except for maybe the, the grunge era of music but now everything seemed to have this angst this anger this hate this vitriol this evil and what it seemed like also is that as a country we were learning again how to live with one another to, we, were, we were learning afresh in this new world how to live together and other than that kind of honeymoon period right after the attacks where we were united in this great patriotic fervor as the years went on what what i saw was that i didn't like the ways that we were trying to live together that hate was beginning to dominate fear and anger was beginning to dominate and so my very first sermon was a sermon about how love conquers hate now Fast forward to today, and what we find is, sadly, our own next catastrophic event that we are going through. In fact, it's kind of a convergence of these events. We have the, the rising racial tensions that are amongst us. We have, again, another political divide that seems as heightened as ever. And, of course, all of this is happening then in the midst of a pandemic that our country has not seen at, at least in, since the likes of the Spanish flu in the early 1900s. In light of all of these things, when we hear words like love wins or that light overcomes darkness, words that echo King or Paul in Romans 12, what can happen is that for some, these words can now actually seem to echo a little hollow. They, they they, they feel shallow to us. To say that love wins or that love conquers hate when we are in such a time of unrest or injustice can feel like a Pollyanna statement preached from the mouths of babes who simply have not yet experienced the real world, or at least have never tried to merge on 495 during the height of rush hour. But for many of us, to simply say love thy neighbor can now almost feel like a platitude. In the same way in which there are some who get angry at the, the term thoughts and prayers as it feels like an overuse when, when all that is wanted is in fact action, this response of love wins or light overcomes darkness can in a way feel the same. It can in a way feel like an excused passivity to the evil that we see. It can feel like a, just throwing in kindness in the midst of hate and injustice and excuse us from doing anything about it. But the truth is that there's nothing passive about these words of love that we have from Paul in Romans 12. Since school's getting back into to gear soon, I thought that we would do a little exercise to get our minds ready for it, a little grammar exercise. And so... Uh, I invite you, if you have your Bibles, uh, to pull them out and get ready for this in Romans 12, 9 through 21. And if you don't have one nearby, you can try to follow along on the screen with the scripture that we have there. And if you remember your grammar from elementary school, you remember that you would have learned that verbs are the action words. Verbs show us what we are doing, what we are active in. So unlike in 1 Corinthians, where Paul is talking about love and uses a bunch of adjectives, which are words that modify a noun, you know, words like love is patient, love is kind, here in Romans 12, where Paul talks about love again, 
I want us to look at all of the verbs that Paul uses, the action words that he talks about, how it is that Paul describes love. Now, as we do this, uh, I want you to feel free to join in by actually typing in some of the verbs that you see. You, know, you have this as a collective activity where we write down some of the verbs that we find in Romans 12, 9 through 21. And so as we look through this scripture, some of these verbs that we will find are hate, hold, outdo, do not lag, be ardent, serve, rejoice, be patient, persevere in prayer, contribute, extend hospitality, bless, do not curse, weep, live in harmony, do not be haughty, associate, do not claim, do not repay, take thought, never avenge, leave room, feed, give, do not be overcome, and overcome. And as you've gone through your own list, maybe you have found others that I have missed myself. But what we find as we look through these action verbs, you know, action words, these verbs, is that there is absolutely nothing that is passive about Paul's idea of love. As we see this long list of verbs that he uses, we find that, in fact, for Paul, to love means to be actively engaged. Love is not simply an emotion for Paul, nor is love some perfect, calm, zen mindset that we can get ourselves into. Love is a verb. Love is action. To love, as Paul describes it, is to actively counter the hate and the evil that we see in this world. But we do so not by matching the evil and hate blow for blow, but by in everything that we do, actively living out a different and better way. In other words, we counter hate and evil by overcoming it by actively loving. Paul's juxtaposition here of love and hate serves for us as a call to action of sorts, an action of, of actively loving. Here in Romans, he shows us how multifaceted that action looks, that there are so many ways in our day-to-day -day lives that we are called to be active in loving one another, and that this is how we are called to live amongst each other. But this juxtaposition between love and hate not only serves as a call to action, but it also serves for us as a warning. It's why he ends this section by saying, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul recognizes that hate and evil bring out the very worst in us. I mean, all we have to do is look at our political and cultural context that's going on right now as proof of it. And none of us can deny that we see so much hate and so much evil. And we know that we ourselves can be so easily dragged into it. There is certainly wrong and evil in the world. And we know as Christians that we are called to act. But the danger is that as we become consumed in fixing these evils, as we put our hearts and our souls into combating the hate, that we ourselves, in fact, can be filled with the very hate and evil that we are combating. We can begin to see and treat people not with grace, but with contempt and judgment. We can demonize others instead of recognizing others as those who have been created in the beautiful image of God. It is as Nietzsche warns, He who fights monsters should be careful, lest he there before comes a monster himself. He goes on to say, if you gaze for long into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Paul serves this scripture to us as a warning. That as we try to conquer hate with its own sources, that we ourselves will be conquered by hate. We ourselves will be conquered by evil. 
that in fact the only way to conquer evil and hate is to live out a different way to live out something greater to actively live out love and to set it as an example of everything that we do and so it's no coincidence then that this section on love comes on the heels of Paul's discussion of the body of Christ in fact it's not the only time that Paul does this when Paul discusses his famous 1 Corinthians 13 section that we talked about earlier of love is patient love is kind is not envious or boastful this comes on the heels of 1 Corinthians 12's discussion on you guessed it the body of Christ and it's because you see love is not just a nice sentiment it is in fact what we need it's what the body needs to live love overcomes evil is not a Pollyanna statement it is for Paul the only way to live as a member of Christ and it's why he's so adamant then why love must be sincere. If we aren't actively loving, actively serving, actively rejoicing, actively weeping with others, if we aren't actively persevering in prayer or blessing those, even blessing those who persecute us, if we aren't feeding and quenching the thirst of even our enemies, then we aren't actively living out as the body of Christ. If we fail to love, if we fail to see the worth of others as those who are created in the image of God, then we eventually will become just like our enemies. We will become overcome by the same hate and evil that we are fighting. But what Paul points out to us is that Christ has shown us a better way. It's not necessarily an easier way. We all know it's, it's so hard to offer grace and love and forgiveness, especially to those who do not extend it back to us. But there is power in a radical and active love, especially in a time of great hate and hostility. And just imagine right now in this time of COVID-19, if we started to show some grace to one another, you know, recognizing that we're all struggling, if in doing so we were able to break that snowballing chain of stress and frustration that we're all feeling and put an end to it, we would be the stop to it by showing love to somebody else and saying, you know what, I know you're struggling, you are enough. Imagine as racial tensions continue to flare, if we actually took time to hear the pain and hurt and fears of others instead of continually meeting it with anger or defensiveness? What if in our own families or in our own workplaces or in our friend group or even our churches, we committed not simply to being nice or kind to one another, but to actively living out love, to living out that long list of verbs that Paul uses here in Romans 12. You see, people call it Poly Pollyanna if they want. But I think they do this because it's hard. They think it's a pipe dream because it's not easy to do. It demands more from us. But it gives more as well. As we give more, we also receive more love and grace and forgiveness. Because this is how we live together. We live together extending the same love and grace and forgiveness as we have experienced from God. We have been given unconditional love, unconditional grace, unconditional mercy and forgiveness by our Lord and Savior. We get the opportunity to conquer hate by setting an example, by showing that in the world, by actively living that out the same way that Jesus actively lived it out in his life and ministry and even death on the cross. It is not easy, but love does overcome evil. Love does win. That love takes action. It takes intention, it takes sincerity, but it wins. It's a message 
good enough for today, good enough for when I preached it as a young youth, good enough for Martin Luther King Jr., good enough for when Paul said it, and it'll be good enough forever. Because love wins. Love will always win. It may be hard to accept it, but when we live out that act of love, when we show that better way, hate and evil can't overcome that. Love wins. Amen. Thank you, Daniel, for that wonderful, timely message. At this point in time, we invite you to share your glory sightings. Just type them into Facebook, um, ways in which you have seen God working in your life, the life of your families and friends, the community, the world at large. And as you do that, um, we will be singing, They Will Know We Are Christians By Our Love. Take this time to either sing along at home, type in your glory sightings, or just use it as a time of meditation on what we have just heard. We are one in spirit. at this point in time um, looking for you to lift up any of your glory sightings uh, prayer requests and we will um, go ahead and talk about those um, praise for the wonderful message that Daniel brought us this morning it was in fact very timely and I think something we all need to remember um, just want to lift up the students and the teachers and the administrators as they prepare to go back to school in what has to be a very challenging time for all of them. And we just pray uh, God's blessings upon them as they get ready to, to do that. Um, also pray for the victims of the hurricane down along the Gulf Co Coast, the people out in California dealing with the wildfires, and um, just um, prayers for, for our country and world in general. Sandy's lifting up um, praises for Dave's successful surgery. We, uh, we hope that he's recovering well and has a minimum amount of pain. Prayers for um, a cousin, Cheryl. We want to um, just pray as for our church family and the love that we share with one another. Even though we cannot be together, that love is still there and shared among us. Prayers for a neighbor of Aaron Heffron who lost her husband this week. 
we just pray that you would uh, surround her with comfort and love as she goes through this time of grief. For, from David Hall, joy for Olivia's face on being back to college while showing us her dorm room. Okay, so they got to see the dorm room. Um, we also want to keep in mind um, those who are are ill, are homebound uh, people who just can't get out. Prayers for a dear friend being treated for lung cancer from Jennifer. We want to um, pray for her that she will be surrounded by love and concern that the medical team taking care of her will be um, able to, to bring healing there. Janet is lifting up prayers for Malone and family as they go through COVID-19. Um, we just really want to lift up to God concerns for not only our friends and family, but our country and the world as we deal with this pandemic, that uh, we would find a way to um, eradicate this, that we would uh, pray for those who have lost loved ones, who are currently sick, and those who are recovering. Prayers that our community can come together and love and support for one another during all these tough times. Absolutely. Prayers for the people um, of, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, but you can read it. Um, and <laughs> Jacob Blake and his family, particularly for those who witnessed the shooting. Um, we just pray for the the racial unrest that is going on in our country. We just pray for showers of justice and righteousness to come down that all people can be treated equally regardless of the color of their skin. We also pray for our um, police, law enforcement, and first responders that they will be able to do their job safely but also in a... Um, a way that, that protects those. And so now if you would just join me in uh, prayer as we lift up these concerns, those that have been voiced and those that have not been voiced, but God knows what is on our hearts. Lord, we just thank you once again for being with us, for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We pray for those who are battling illness, um, for cancer, those recovering from surgeries, those who have been afflicted with COVID-19, those who are um, having mental health issues during this time of increased stress and anxiety. We pray for those who have dementia, for our homebound. Lord, you know the concerns of our hearts and all of the, the people of God and that you would just be mindful of those that you would give us strength um, love to reach out to one another wisdom and discernment we ask that you be with our country during this time of great strife that you would help us as Christians to reach out in love not in hate to overcome evil not by cursing but by blessing and with grace we ask that you be with not only Round Hill United Methodist Church, but all of the churches, both United Methodist and the, the body of Christ in the world, that you would help us to be your church in these troubling times, to help us to reach out, to share our reason for hope, our love that funnels through us from you, and that we would be able to share that with our neighbors. Lord, we lift up our uh, administrators, our students, our teachers as they prepare to go back to school, that you would help them make this a time that they can not only learn but also reconnect with those friends that even though they cannot be in person, that they will still have that connection. We ask that you be with those who have experienced natural disasters, whether hurricanes, fires, floods. Um, we just ask that you be with those and that you would en enable those resources to reach them, those people to help them and to uh, share their 
love with them. And we ask all this in the name of your precious son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And so uh, at this point in time, I just want to list up the e-note that goes out each week. It has all of the announcements and the activities. If you happen to miss them as they were scrolling prior to the service beginning, if you do not receive the e-note and you want to, uh, just send an email to office at roundhillumc.org. And also invite you to go to our website. Uh, we have several ways of online giving to support the ministries here at Round Hill United Methodist Church. Or if you want, you can just put a check in the mail to the church office. Um, that address is also on the website. And so now, receive this benediction. Go therefore in love to overcome evil, not by cursing, but by blessing and grace. Amen. To the Father, all praise to Jesus is all.